right, church? All right. Yeah. God created another beautiful day for us. And uh, yeah. if you've been in Vermont a long time, you know that feeling of just enjoying the foliage season because it's kind of the reward so of, of uh, you have a long winter, uh, muddy spring, and then a hot summer. And then we finally, at least from my perspective, we get to the perfect weather. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's gorgeous, and God has, has created that for us. And it's a time of year where I can put my car short, shorts away and put on my or pants, All right. <laughs> put my t-shirts away and put on the flannel. And I'm, I'm super disappointed. There are at least four guys in this church that have the same shirt and nobody wore it. <laughs> not, yeah, not get the flannel. So we'll have to put out an announcement next time and try that. Um, so we are going through the Book of Romans, and I was somewhat excited when Peter asked me to be a part of the um, teaching team because Romans is an incredibly deep book with a lot of big words and, and uh, some, some, some deep um, truths. And you know, talking about sanctification and justification by faith and, and uh, the, the whole struggle with sin. And, and uh, I ended up with chapter two, which is just one big truth bomb. And, uh, <laughs> there's no fancy concepts. It's just Bill, uh, just uh, Paul, I don't know where Bill came from. Um, <laughs> Paul just getting in their face All right. uh, from, from the start of chapter two. Yeah. And he kind of sets the, the, the stage in, in Romans one that the, the world um, and its worldliness is, is just missing the mark. And they've, they've given up worship for God, and they're worshiping created things, and they're just looking for ways to sin. And then he goes into two, and he addresses the church. And um, I don't know if you guys remember from Mike Fix's lesson, uh, probably a couple months ago now, he talked about the, the church in Rome was made up of three different uh, types of people. There were the, the Jews who established the, the church in Rome. There were the, um, the converts, uh, the Gentiles who were converted, in the church and had been around probably 15, 20 years because being at Pentecost and now we're, we're looking uh, 15, 20 years later. And then there were the new converts that came along along the way. And so it was a, it was a varied um, audience for, for Paul. But I found something else that I, I was reminded of something else that I'd learned years ago and that there was a whole other factor going on here because in the reign of Claudius in Rome in somewhere 49 AD, he decided that the Jews were trouble and he expelled all the, Jew, all the Jews out of out of Rome, and we know that it's a fact because it's in, uh, quoted in, in Acts 18, uh, where um, Luke writes that Priscilla and Aquila, who we know from Rome, are visiting Paul in, in Greece, and they were visiting you know, visiting him because they were expelled from from uh, uh, Rome. And so I was thinking about about that more and more. What did that really mean for the Roman Church? Because if they if they were expelled in 49, and he's writing this letter, you know, 56, 57. Um, AD, he's writing to a church that lost its Jewish leadership for a period of time. It was at the, at the start of the reign of Nero, they were allowed to come back. And so at this point, Priscilla and Aquila are back in Rome, and he's writing to that, that church. And so through that transition, that church was established by Jewish leadership. There was a strong Jewish um, um, uh, angle to it. And the folks in that church who were not Jew were heavily reliant on the Jews because they were the text. They knew the law. They had memorized it, but the, the Gentiles hadn't. And so they were relying on the Jews just for that knowledge, that text. They were uh, relying on them for their spiritual maturity. And now all that's gone. And it's gone for five years. And so, so they're trying to figure out, what do we do with this? So I think that the Roman church kind of took a turn and they had to deal with a, a lot of different situations that an immature church would have to deal with. And I think Paul is addressing that. He addresses it from, from chapter one, and, and throughout the book, he's trying to address the fact that there's, there's a spiritual immaturity even when the Jews came back. And I don't know what that was like. Um, I know in my own history in, in church, when leadership changes, there's sometimes a little tension. Or when leadership leaves and comes back, there could be some tension because, hey, that's not how we're doing it anymore. You wanna do it the old way, and, and it, it, we're human. And with humans, there's going to be conflict. And so I, I'm not sure exactly what was going on, but, but Romans 1 and 2 and later, later in the book, it's, there's obviously some, some uh, conflict within the church. And uh, so Romans 2, there's no, no technical or uh, highly technical teaching here. It's, he's just going after the folks that are judging, and they're hypocritical about their judging. And I think through the, uh, Romans 2, He's addressing those who are new converts. 
he's addressing those who uh, are maybe been around for a while that were Gentile, and then, then he lays it out for the Jews as well. And he <coughs> and makes a plea for them to, to, to be united, but he also wants to um, um, really let them know that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. You know, the Jews were called first, but then the Gentile uh, wasn't. And God has no um, um, preference for either one. He wants all, all to be saved. <clears throat> and I think there are three fundamentals in, in the um, chapter two that, that we need to look at. And one is, uh, the first is how God feels about hypocritical judging. I think we know, but we're going to read about it. Uh, there's a plea for unity amongst the church, the Jew and the Gentile. And then there's a whole concept of the church in Rome began to take on the, the whole Hellenistic mindset. They began to, to worship the created instead of the creator. And it caused problems. And that's probably what caused the bickering and the, the hypocrisy. Yep. And Paul wants to address that as well. And I don't know if you remember from your history classes about the whole um, Alexander the Great and the, and the Greek Empire and, and Hellenism. But it was it, Alexander the Great knew that he couldn't rule with an iron fist because his empire was getting too large. So he, he wisely decided that if I can create a gospel, a good news for the Greek and everyone we conquer, then people want to be a part of it. And I can put that stipulation, I can provide uh, theater, I can provide art, I can provide healthcare, I can pr provide education, I can provide athletics. They're all a great life. That's his, his good news that he's pr proclaiming. And I can provide those things with the caveat that you need to follow me and you need to abide by me. And it worked. And so the Romans saw that as well. And they, as the Greek Empire fails and the Roman Empire rises, they take on that Hellenism. And they, they want, to, want to be able to rule the same way as Alexander the Great. And it permeated not, not only Rome, uh, the Rome culture, but also in the church culture, culture as well. And we see that uh, in Romans, that uh, people began in Romans 125, read, uh, read last week um, with Peter, that they, um, they stopped worshiping God and they start worshiping the created instead. So we'll look at that as well. So with that uh, background, um, I wanted to start in uh, verse 1 of, of chapter 2. It says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment is against those who do, do such things. Sorry. We know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape, escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? See, so somehow in, in the, the whole worldliness of, of, of the church and the change in, in leadership, they forgot God's kindness. And they weren't moved by God's kindness. They were more motivated by judging others to make them feel better even when they were doing the same things. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what, we, what they have done to those who, by persis persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth, follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human, human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. And uh, Peter and I were talking about this Thursday night, and he said, are you sure there was conflict in the church? And I said, that, that tells me right there, there's conflict. <laughs> that, that last line, that, that uh, God doesn't show favoritism. If God isn't showing favoritism and he has to point that out, that means they are sharing favoritism. And they're, they're building their own schisms and there's conflict because they don't understand the patience and, and forbearance, the kindness of God. <clears throat> and uh, Paul writes in, in Romans 16, uh, Steve read it a few weeks ago, where he's sending, uh, uh, Paul is sending Priscilla and Aquila back um, to the... Um, to the to, to Rome, and he says, "Be kind to them, receive them well, 
because they cared for the the, um, the Gentiles here. And so he, he, Paul's trying really hard to, to build this union and say, you know, there is no no Jew and Gentile. There is no favoritism for, for either one. You guys just need, need to get along. Yep. Verse 12, uh, Paul begins to address the, the new convert, the, the, the Gentile. He says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law and who will be declared righteous. That uh, who obey the who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature is required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and other times def even defending them. <coughs> This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Christ Jesus, as my gospel declares. So he's, he's dealing with those folks that didn't have the law. They didn't have really any knowledge of God, except for what was in their heart. And he's saying, you guys, you're judging one another based on what's even coming from your own heart. It's con convicting you of what other people are doing, but it's not convicting you of what you're doing. And he's, he's asking just self-examine and understand that. He ends that uh, uh, verse uh, 16 by saying, as my gospel declares. And I don't know what that means. I'm trying to figure that out. I've read a lot of commentaries. Why did he say my gospel? Because in most he refers three times in his writings uh, as my gospel. All the other times he refers to it as the gospel. And there's a lot of commentary about it. Some guys say, well, it's, uh, it's because Peter had a different gospel when he was preaching because he was using... The resurrection as, as proof that Jesus was the Messiah, whereas Paul uses the resurrection and the, and the good news of the res resurrection as um, the sign of salvation. Not the sign of the Messiah, but a sign of salvation. That's where we get our salvation through, is through the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. So that, that's one thought. And then my other thought was that he felt so deeply about the gospel, it was so personal to him that it became his gospel. Um, but Whatever the reason, I think it's, it's important that Paul's just trying to con convey that message that you guys need to stop worrying about what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. You need to stop worrying about who said what right. and what they did. And you just need to start focus focusing, on, focusing on yourself and focusing on, on Jesus as well. Thanks, Larry. <clears throat> And in uh, verse 17, Paul begins to, to address the Jews, and he says, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and, and approve of what is superior because you were instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor for the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have a law in, it, in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then... Who teach others do you teach do you not teach yourself you who preach against stealing do you steal you who say that people should not commit adultery do you commit adultery you who abhor idols do you rob temples you who boast in the law do you dishonor God by breaking the law as writ, as it is written God's name is blas blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you and again it's just an, another truth bomb for the Jews and then and they're saying you guys were the teachers you guys were the leaders the church relied upon you and so, somehow something changed. You stopped caring about the church. You started caring about yourselves. You stopped caring about the, the, the whole servant mentality that Jesus uh, laid out for you. And it all became about you. And it, I've read this, this uh, passage in the past, and it, it pricks my heart every time. Because it takes me back to uh, my senior year in high school. And, uh, what the, year was that? Uh, it was a while ago. <laughs> I can tell you there were no cell phones. Um, the uh, principal, the, the, the preceding senior class in their senior pranks, did a lot of damage, uh, a lot of physical and expensive damage. And so the principal, all year long, is letting us know that's, that's not going to happen. He's laying down the law. He says, I, I love a good senior prank, but nobody's going to cause damage. And so I was thinking about that, and I, uh, uh, we're getting towards graduation and I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know what, great idea, let's, let's sell the school. 
the whole concept of <laughs> steal a couple of real estate signs, put them on the, on the front lawn. <laughs> and it's, it's tasteful, it's simple, there's no damage. I mean, maybe we stole a couple of signs or whatever. <laughs> so I, we went out to the movies on a Friday night and I introduced the idea to, to my buddies and they all loved it. And so we get in my dad's truck and, uh, and then another buddy's car. And uh, so we're heading down looking for, uh, we're actually trying to get close to the school so we can make it happen quickly. And uh, get down there and we stop at 7-Eleven and we talk, talk to some other friends and they said, oh, that's a great idea too. And so we start out and I see a, stop, a sign on a, on a lawn and I pull up to it and buddy jumps out, grabs the sign, throws it in the back of my dad's truck. And uh, oh, there's another one. And it just kind of snowballed from there. So we were there, my truck, my dad's truck, another car were there, we're unloading these signs. And uh, there's still another car out there gathering signs and it went on. So about midnight, we're thinking, we gotta, we gotta get going, we gotta get set up, we can't wait for these guys. And at that time we had over 50 signs. <laughs> a couple dozen garden gnomes and figurines and that sort of thing. <laughs> and a five foot plastic frosty. <laughs> and my feeling was that we should have stolen because if Frosty's still out there in May, he doesn't, doesn't belong in the front line. <laughs> so we're starting to set the signs up and all of a sudden the police cruiser pulls in. Uh, and all my buddies just scatter. I'm thinking, I can't go anywhere because my dad's truck's there. They're going to notice me. And uh, then another cruiser pulls in. And so I think they got us, two, two or three of us at that point. And then another cruiser pulls in, and it turns out they got another four guys running. And so they said, uh, "Okay, guys, we need to, get to start loading these signs in the back of the cruisers, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna put them back." And uh, which was an idle threat. But we started loading up the, the cruisers. We got uh, most of them. There's still probably a dozen uh, signs that couldn't fit in the cruisers. So we had them stack, had to stack them on the on the sidewalk. And, uh, so they cuffed us, put us in the back of the cruisers, took us to jail, mug shots, fingerprints, everything. They put us in a cell and they handcuffed us to the bench. And I'm thinking this is a little overboard because there are guys in here that are scary looking at me and they're not handcuffed. <laughs> so they're obviously trying to make a point to us. And the whole time we we're just sitting there thinking, oh, I'm so stupid. And I'm thinking, please don't call me that. Please don't call me that. <laughs> and, uh, so one by one, all my buddies are leaving. And I'm thinking, mm, please call my dad. <laughs> I'm handcuffed to the bench, and I'm the only guy left other than these guys that belong here. <laughs> and uh, so my dad shows up about six. I learned later from my stepmother that he, that he got the call like at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and my stepmother said he went back to bed, got up in the morning, he showered, shaved, had breakfast, he took his time. <laughs> he was very deliberate about this whole thing. So he shows up and I couldn't even look at him. I just, you know, dropped my head and said, you know, sorry, Dad. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you learned your lesson. I said, uh, yeah, I can guarantee you I've learned my lesson. And uh, then, then the true prick of the heart came. He said, you know, you've done a lot of things that, that made me proud, but this isn't one of them. Mm. And it was just like, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, coming from my dad, that's, mm. it hurt. Yeah. So I think about this, this scripture, and I think about, you know, from, from God's perspective, is he, he's looking at the Romans saying, come on, guys, just go along. You know, I, I used to be proud. You, you revive our church, you're, you're growing, you're, you're spreading the gospel, you're loving one another. But now, Paul writes, God's name is blasphemed, <coughs> blasphemed among, the, uh, among the Gentiles because of you. And I think about my father, he was very committed to the community. He was a scoutmaster most of his life. He, you know, having six kids, he was highly involved with, with scouting. Um, he was heavy in the Rotary Club. Uh, he, he always used to preach the, the line that uh, it's always service before self. And uh, he, he lived it. Uh, he was uh, involved in the Catholic Church. He, used, he was very good about giving to community. And I didn't, our whole incident didn't end up in the Denver Post or the Rocky Mountain News. But it did end up in the Lakewood Sentinel, which was a weekly, weekly paper. <clears throat> and I just remember thinking, yeah, that's not guys, that's not good. Dean Slater's son was caught doing, doing something really stupid. And I, you know, I think about that every time. And I think that's just what, what God is saying. You know, people don't respect me because of the way you're acting. Mm -hmm. People won't receive my love, my patience, my, my uh, un um, unending love 
because of the way you guys are acting. You're making a mockery of me. And you're telling people that you, they need to, 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 to worship the created, not the creator. That's wrong. And I'm guessing the way this was worded and how it was delivered by Paul <coughs> pricked some hearts and made some change in the church. <clears throat> Verse 25, Paul kind of, kind of turns a corner and he goes back to, to more of, of theology and just trying to reason um, with both the Jew and the Gentile. Verse 25 he says, Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you have not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the, law, the law's requirements, they will not be regarded as though they were circumcised. The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have, have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Verse 28 says, A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the written code, such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Mm. And again, it's that whole concept of this, there's that transition of worshiping the Creator and then going and worshiping the created. Mm. You know, circumcision was created for the Jews as a mark, as a covenant. But they began to worship that circumcision. Nothing else mattered other than their fact is uh, their, their uh, uh, status as a Jew and being circumcised. They were better, they had the law. They were chosen first by God. And that, all those things were created for them, and they began to worship those things. And I think if we're looking at this and we want to learn from Romans 2, I think we have to look at the same thing. Yeah. There are things that God has created for us, that has given us given, and blessed us with, that some, some, somehow become our objects of worship. Our jobs can become the created that we worship. We, you know, we pour our lives into it. And it's, it's good. We need to, we need to excel and, and um, be glorious in our positions. But the glory should be for God. And sometimes we lose, lose uh, sight of that. And we begin to worshiping that job that's created for us. Our possessions, our cars, our homes, they become more important to us. Um, our accomplishments. And we begin to, to lean on those. And those things that are created become more important to us. So I think we need to look at that and we need to think about that. What has God created for us? What has he blessed us with? That we worship more than God himself. I think there are times in our lives, in our spiritual lives, where we can feel good about our spiritual accomplishments. I had my devotional time, my daily devotional time with God for 30 days. In a row, and we begin to worship our own accomplishment. That, mm -hmm. and then day thirty-one, we don't, and we fall apart mm -hmm. because that accomplishment mm -hmm. was way more important. Mm -hmm. I think as as Christians, uh, we can look at baptism, and baptism and circumcision aren't the same thing, but I think in some ways for us, baptism is like circumcision, mm -hmm. and we feel comfortable and say, you know, "I've been baptized, so I'm good." Or we look at other people, I mean, look at religious people who maybe, maybe, maybe not even believe in baptism, and we can feel better about ourselves because we've been baptized. Mm -hmm. And we begin to worship that concept of baptism and belonging instead of worshiping God and our place yeah. and the fact that he's the reason why we're there. Mm -hmm. That's not by our own accomplishments. And I think we can take that, that false security in our, in our baptisms just as the Jews were taking the false security in, the, in their circumcision. And we can be just like them. We can be condescending to others, even the, the religious. We can be condescending to, to one another because based on our, our accomplishments for the week. You know, this is what I did. I'm more evangelist than you. Mm -hmm. No, I may not have been last week. <laughs> And we just get into that, that whole mindset of it, you know, Christianity and church is just a competition. We're competing with the world, we're competing with one another. In reality, when we get in that mindset, we're just competing with God. And we should be. Uh, 
um, glorifying him, serving him. <clears throat> and I think about uh, us as Christians and how often do we examine ourselves and compare ourselves to the world in a positive light. I think if everybody here thought about the people that are around them, I bet you could find somebody that was more devoted to the poor. And they may, may not go to church. I know of people who have been more devoted to orphans than Carol and I have, and they don't go to church. Or some don't even go to our church. I think there are more people that are more sacrificial in giving of time and of money than I am. I think there are um, people who care more for the homeless. It's a huge issue in Burlington right now. And how many times have you driven by a homeless person judging them as you go by? You know, thoughts of, man, they're lazy. They're just trying to, they're trying to beat the system. They make me feel uncomfortable. Whereas there are people all around that are feeding these people. They're housing them. They're caring for them. And it's convicting because we're Christians. Mm -hmm. and we, we're not perfect. We're called to be perfect. But I think it's a thing that we need to, to think about in our daily lives and, and think about, you know, do we honor our father and mother as well as anybody else? As Sue was talking about the other day, how are we at hospitality? Because there's a lot of people who aren't Christians that are really good at hospitality and they're respected for it. <clears throat> how devoted are we to our children? How good are we at loving our neighbor? I can tell you, Carolyn and I moved in a new neighborhood a few years ago, and it's been really tough to be a good neighbor because all the stuff that goes on. It, just, it was a weird situation to begin with, and I fought to try and be nice to our neighbors and got nothing back. And the last incident that happened, I was, was towards the end of the winter, there's a culvert that goes under the road into one of the neighbor's yards, and it was jammed with ice. And all the other neighbors were just driving through it, doing nothing about it. So I went out there, and I was poking a, um, the chim chimney sweep rod that you gave me to, to try and break out the ice. And the, one of the neighbors comes out and says, uh, I'd appreciate it if you let me know when you're gonna be on my property. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in the road. And I, and I said, Mark, and then the big conflict with him was- Let's just call him Mark. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we'll name him Mark. Um, uh, he wanted to use the property. And it was a nice piece of property. He wanted to walk on it, and so he just did it. And, and we caught him one day, and he was very sheepish. And, and we said, Mark, you know, appreciate you, um, you know, your desire for our land, but it'd be nice if you ask us. And so he tried to turn that around me when I'm cleaning up the culvert. and said, oh, you, you need to ask me to be on my land. I said, well, Mark, it's not the same thing. I've got a legal right away here, and I have a responsibility to maintain it. And, and after that, I'm thinking, how I love this neighbor. <laughs> I just, and it's been tough. And it's, it's a challenge every day. But you know, think about that. Are you a better neighbor than your neighbor is? That maybe somebody who doesn't believe in God? It's not easy. Right. I want to lift up folks. I mean, Peter, it's not my story to tell, but he had a um, um, situation with, with his neighbor. His neighbor needed help, and, and he stepped in and helped his neighbor and his wife. And, and he just, did it because he wanted to love his neighbor. And I think about those who are making sacrifices, everybody working in the healthcare industry through the, through the pandemic. It's incredible what was asked of these folks to expose themselves. Don't lift those folks up. And, and, and you know, those are good things. You know, I think about Larry and, and volunteering for the um, Sail Beyond Cancer Board and his work with that. And, there's stories all through the church, and so I want to commend everybody for what you're doing. But I also want to challenge you and challenge myself that we need to keep thinking about what, what can we do to be as more. We're being called to be perfect by God, and so there's plenty of opportunities. And I think we have to get our own, in our own way because we're so judgmental towards others. And we're, um, we're not thinking about the feelings of others, we're only thinking about ourselves. And we get to that, that point where we're we're not worshiping the Creator anymore. We're worshiping ourselves, our accomplishments, everything that's been created around us that, that we love.
protect that and we worship that and we lose sight of what God's really asking us to do. So as we take communion this morning and, and we go to prayer, I want you guys to, to really examine yourselves and just, just think about um, how can we be different and make a difference so that what we're doing doesn't blaspheme God. What, so that what, what we're doing isn't uh, causing other people to stumble and not want to be close to God, not want to, want to go to church, not want to be associated with Christians. It's convicting, so it is pretty, uh, we can think about that as we examine ourselves. Let's pray. God, we are uh, grateful to be here this morning, and um, we're grateful for Paul's truth bombs. And uh, just to, for a time to, to reflect, um, there's so much in, in the Bible that we can read and, and just feel good about, but we also know that there's so much in the Bible that we need to read and, and reflect and, and be convicted, have our hearts pricked. And I pray that that's what you're doing for us this morning, God, that you can uh, really work on our hearts, help us to understand uh, where we're lacking, encourage us where we're um, working towards perfection, uh, but really just to, just to focus on you first and focus on others. And uh, I'm just so grateful for, for great examples and uh, in the church and outside the church. And so grateful for everything you've created us to help us to focus on you, the, the creator. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.